Well, well, what? Just, just. Yeah. Hello? It was? No. Plan B. Plan B. Hello? Hello? Well, welcome once again to Art Break, everyone. Um, we have slight uh, technical issues, hence I'm hunching over this microphone. Um, but again, welcome all. And um, this year we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Kalamazoo Public Library. And better, it says this. Is this on? It says this. Hello. Okay, I'll try to talk. You can also just. Oh. Okay, good. Okay, so we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Kalamazoo Public Library, which is, I think, a major uh, accomplishment or uh, event in our cultural life. Uh, when the uh, library first opened its door in 1872, it had a single room in a building shared by the village government and the police and fire department. Since then, there's obviously been a lot of changes, growth and development, and the library is really now on the cutting edge of what uh, libraries are going to be in the uh, uh, coming future. Well, an interesting part of the history is that the Kalamazoo Public Library also kind of shared in the growth of two other important cultural institutions, the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, or what became the Valley Museum, and also the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. And for a period of roughly 20 years, um, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, which was really kind of searching to kind of find its role in the community, its identity, shared a space uh, with the, um, the public library. And uh, it was an interesting period because the KIA was really kind of growing in, trying to find its role, and uh, there's some, some growing pains involved with this process. Anyway, to tell us uh, more about uh, the relationship between our two institutions, we're very pleased to have with us Ryan Gage. Uh, Ryan um, heads up the local history department at the uh, Kalamazoo Public Library. Uh, he's been there for quite a while and performed a number of different roles. Um, he's been the collection manager for the audiovisual department. Uh, he's also been the legal librarian and also raised their, uh, arranged their musical programs. So, but today he's going to talk about uh, the relevant history here. So please welcome Ryan Gage. <laughs> for coming out today to uh, listen to me talk a little bit about history. Um, I wanted to uh, thank KIA for the invitation to come and speak today. Uh, Lauren Mullen, the librarian here, reached out to me a few months ago and uh, probably saw that we were planning on doing some programs in celebration of the library's 150th anniversary and said, hey, why don't you think about maybe doing a program that involves the Art Institute? And um, I said, sure, I know nothing about it. So I will get into the archives and kind of dig through and find uh, out whether or not there's a, a story to tell. And I think there is a story. Um, and so I probably should have named this a story within a story because I should also thank the library for surviving 150 years so I can give this presentation. Um, but there are a lot of particular stories about the library, and this is only one of them. Um, roughly a 20 or so uh, year period um, that we're going to talk about today. Um, one of the first um, things I took over about, uh, well, about a year and a half ago, and Ryan Weaver, the director of the library, said, 
hey, this is our you know, 150th birthday is coming up. You might want to you know, do a little bit of thinking about it. And so for the past year, I've been really diving into our archives and I'm learning quite a bit about the library. So um, and this kind of came out of it. So. so I like to think of history in holistic terms. Um, there's so much more than just sort of objective facts and headlines. Those are kind of the, the superficial way that we kind of understand the past. Um, but really, uh, the past is derived from a lot of different factors. And um, when we think about uh, the growth of an art uh, museum here in Kalamazoo, we have to kind of think before it started. What were the kinds of social, economic, cultural conditions which really laid uh, the groundwork um, for the development of the Art Institute? And um, featured here, uh, Detroit, Muskegon, and Grand Rapids um, preceded Kalamazoo uh, in having an art museum, but statewide, um, we were certainly within uh, one of the first. Um, the 1920s were obviously a boom time economically, and we have the growth of the Kalamazoo Symphony Orchestra, the Kalamazoo Foundation, and the Kalamazoo Civic Players. So there was certainly momentum in and around the community for uh, the development of an art museum. Um, a stable homegrown economy. Yes, we were a celery city, we were a paper city, We've been a lot of different cities, small city, um, but Kalamazoo, um, for a lot of different reasons, which are programs unto themselves, um, had a wonderful, stable economy uh, during this time period and it really allowed for um, uh, many of the more affluent members of society um, who were also very giving um, to the cultural and civic life of Kalamazoo and the educational life. Um, that provided um, really the groundwork for um, the city to really kind of invest in the cultural aspects as well. So this is definitely a city of industry uh, in the 1920s, um, but it was also a growing cultural hotspot as well. Uh, I think you can't underestimate the influence of um, our community's uh, commitment to education. Um, the influence of the high school art department, uh, having university colleges here certainly helped to kind of create um, certainly interested people in art. And um, then we have the Albert M. Todd collection um, that i briefly talk about, but also I want to mention here that in 1923, many of you probably know where the Crane Building is, across the street from the library. Um, but the painter Catherine Leon Woods studio was there and she gathered several uh, students, um, people who were interested in developing an art museum um, at her studio uh, at the Prime Building in 1923. And that's really where the uh, early origins of the Art Institute So for the lovers of history, uh, and especially local history, uh, I don't think we can uh, talk about art here in Kalamazoo without the influence of Albert M. Todd, um, who was the peppermint king, thus the light green text here. And I thought, I didn't think I'd get that one by you, but um, uh, Mr. Todd obviously made uh, his very successful business um, uh, with um, mint oil, uh, which he developed very early on. Um, he grew up down in Nottawa Township area, um, sort of uh, east of Centerville, and he eventually moved his business to Kalamazoo, uh, and it was certainly, uh, in addition to the paper industry in the late 1900s, um, or 1800s, excuse me, um, he had a very successful mint, which, whether it was uh, going to the production of food products, um, medicinal purposes, uh, soaps, any kind of use 
um, for mint, uh, for flavoring. Um, it probably came from Kalamazoo in uh, this time period. Um, he was a world traveler and he had an interest in art and he used a lot of his money to buy uh, porcelain and paintings and sculpture and he was uh, very interested in not just hoarding his collection but to um, to give it away to many of the local institutions here, including the museum and the library, uh, schools, uh, the Art Institute. And he used to keep his offices uh, down at Kalamazoo Avenue open um, for the public to come and to uh, wander through and observe the art that he had collected over time. I realize there's a lot of text there, so don't feel like you need to read it all. Um, one of the times that he did feature his artwork was in 1923, and a group of artists here in Kalamazoo um, were very they were very thankful that he was somebody who promoted art and had an interest in it and made it accessible. Um, but they were certainly thinking a little bit long term. And they wanted uh, to, I don't believe it was really a petition per se, so much as it was a statement to civic leaders to think hard uh, about the development of an art museum. And they said, We deplore the fact that we have no suitable public building for permanent and loan exhibits. We hope that sometime in the not far distant future, there may be a public sentiment created that will demand such a building. So there was definitely momentum. There was something in the air, in the water here at Kalamazoo, where we had a, a, a real uh, healthy infrastructure that would uh, go into the production uh, of an art museum. Looking at where the KIA came from, uh, we start with the Kalamazoo chapter of the American Federation of the Arts and the Pallet and Chisel Club. And from what my research can re reveals, um, the, the Council chapter of the American Federation of Arts seemed to be a collection of those interested in uh, art history, in uh, the promotion of art as a public good, um, and they were very interested in having some sort of space so um, exhibits could be featured. Um, and I think the Palette Chisel Club was a little bit more hands-on. It was they were artists and instructors. Um, the two of these two groups um, came together um, probably at the Prank Building in 1923 um, to discuss the creation of the first organization. Um, the American Federation of Arts was a national group. Um, and Kalamazoo had uh, the chapter. Uh, they incorporated in 1924, um, and they uh, changed the name um, to Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Uh, the member dues were five dollars then, and they had a first exhibit in uh, 1924. I've seen various dates for that actual, so I thought 24, 25, somewhere in that general area is when they had their first public exhibit, which was at the YWCA building. So one of the themes for the next few minutes here while I talk is space. Um, everyone wants it, everybody needs it, and there was only so much of it to go around. And so in 1928, uh, due to spatial constraints, the YWCA uh, looking to expand says, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to find a new home. So, and once again, a lot of text here. Um, as I said, this I found this quote um, from the Countess of Gazette, and it did not have an author, curiously, so it was almost kind of like an advertisement. But I think it speaks to um, this idea that uh, having an art museum would be a public good. It would certainly not only grow the arts here locally, but it would also be something that we could say to other people, please come to our fair city uh, and see the kinds of wonderful uh, art that we both produce as well as exhibit here. Um, 
And so they were definitely going out into the community, whether it was talking to the Aegon Todds of the world um, or other civic leaders. Um, they were definitely trying to get the word out as to why it was important, why it was a value to uh, appreciate art. So this is the Kalamazoo Public Library, the first uh, iteration of it. Um, it's always been in its current location at 315 South Road Street. Uh, it was built in 1893. And uh, this photograph is likely of, uh, or likely from uh, the photographer Skyler Baldwin, who uh, was a very prominent photographer in Michigan, uh, specifically Southwest Michigan. Um, and he worked. Um, doing a lot of stereographs. Um, and the basement um, had one of the first children's departments. So that's one of the many things that was in the building. There were a lot of other things in the building in addition to having books. Um, the Academy of Medicine had an office in the building as well as there were offices for the school system. Um, the school system the, uh, governed the library at the time. Um, but it does include an early art department and a museum collection. And uh, the, they didn't really know what to do with the museum collection. Uh, it was mostly donated uh, by Mr. Horace Peck and in the 1880s. And it was mostly of coral and um, maybe some, uh, some rocks and minerals. It was something that uh, they wanted to do something with, but at the time they didn't have the space, so it ended up in, in the basement of the library. Um, but there was certainly a vision that the museum would develop. Flora B. Roberts. Um, she was the library director starting in 1918 until 1943. And uh, she is my favorite uh, Art or uh, a library director. In terms of her influence on developing the library that we have today, I think it really starts with her. Um, she took over in 1918, and at the time the library was mostly just a building understaffed with a lot of books and a lot of other kinds of materials, um, but not situated in a, in a way that was easily locatable for books. She comes in in 1918 from uh, having been a director at other libraries, and she has a 30-year vision. Um, so she's a mover and shaker, and she has an idea about uh, what the library should look like and how it should be run. So she's very important in uh, the library's history. She had a 30-year plan. And uh, as early as 1925, uh, she suggested that the Art Institute become part of the school system, um, merged with the museum um, governed by the school system. She did a lot uh, in the time period that she was at the library. Much of the archives that I used in uh, my research for today uh, it's comprised of bound volumes of scrapbooks that they started in uh, 1918. Um, cut out pieces of Kalamazoo Gazette articles uh, about the museum and about the library. Um, and so I went through those and it's amazing the continuity of services or programs that kind of developed during her time as director that we still do today. Um, one of the services that we have at the library is called via mail. And so if you aren't able to physically get to the library, uh, we have a staff member who will uh, look for books for you and send them uh, through the mail to your residence. And this is something that I just figured was a very modern idea, but uh, Flora B. Roberts developed that in the 1930s. Uh, she also developed a relationship with the hospital system um, and created hospital service to the patients. She introduced film and uh, music to the collection. Uh, that would go ultimately into the art department's um, 
collection. She modified circulation and loan policies. She developed a library card. She advocated for a new building pretty much from 1918 until she left in 1943. Um, that's certainly due to the lack of space that uh, she had. She, she, the burden of her, her um, she had a, a lot, she was very ambitious and she needed the room to do these kinds of things. And so the, with success also came uh, restrictions on how much space she had to deal with. So she uh, reorganized the entire uh, collection, recataloged it. Um, and I think the one thing that really, she always was in the newspaper, writing, uh, advocating for the library. She was very focused on outreach. And uh, she, was a, she was a mover and shaker, that's all I can say. And she was the president of the Michigan Library Association. So. Now, Blanche Hall, uh, another person who I have found less information about, and I'm sure that maybe other historical institutions here locally have a little bit more than we have at the library, um, but I was able to find a few things about her. And she's important in the story of the Art Institute and the library. Um, she was the KIA president from 1930 to 1936 and a board member for much longer after that. Um, she was described uh, in the Kalamazoo Gazette by a relative as somewhat introverted, so maybe that would explain why there's more information um, from the floor of the Roberts side of the story than there is of the Blanche Hall side. Uh, but certainly if anybody has ever gone to Blanche Hall Park, that was named after her um, she was involved with social work. Uh, she worked at Chicago's Hull House, and she was the founder and first president of the Michigan Museum Association. So she was the Art Institute's, I guess I would characterize her as the Art Institute's first real champion, and somebody who had a very specific vision, I think, for the Art Institute, which um, we'll see may not have been the same vision as others. So to the right here, we have the Peck House, um, which was also called the Library House for most of its time. It kind of goes back and forth, although most Kalamazoo Gazette articles uh, seem to suggest that after 1926, they referred to it pretty prominently as the Library House. Um, it was purchased in 1926 by the Board of Education, and it was just south of the library. Um, we don't really have any photographs in our collection that shows this building and the library together. So for whatever reason, they did not have wide-angle lenses, I guess, back then. And so rarely do you ever see it. Sometimes you'll see it to the side, with maybe a part of the building. But um, this was right next door. And um, it ended up housing the art department and the museum. And the art department, um, starts to develop in the teens, but certainly um, once Flora B. Roberts comes on board, uh, she sees it as just part of library service, um, that uh, education is can be visual, and she certainly had as much interest in developing the art department as uh, with the books. Um, and the museum, by 1927, has it's, it's outgrown the library, it's become very popular, um, and so they needed room. So the Board of Education purchases this house next door. This is a photo of that. Now, the KIA, as we saw, was being uh, evicted from the YWCA, so they were on the lookout for a home. And as I said, as early as 1925, um, the idea of merging the Art Institute with uh, the museum was at least on Flora B. Roberts' mind. So. so in 1929, they move from the YWCA into the library house, and they don't really have a lot. Um, they have a few paintings that were donated as part of their permanent collection, um, but they were able to fit here uh, along with the art department, uh, which 
comprised mostly of slides, some stereographs, eventually films, um, and it was mostly used by uh, the school system and clubs. This is an interior photograph of once you walk in to the foyer there uh, in 1928. And so, as you can see here, houses do not make for, you know, I mean, they, they, they probably crammed this house full of art, um, much of which probably um, was donated by uh, Todd and Peck uh, and other donors. So, now the library art department, this is a photo that I found that I really love because it really does kind of speak to its early uh, service to the school system. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the art department uh, in the school system was very robust um, and they were starting to produce more and more artists and painters um, that would probably come down to the art uh, department here and look through old photographs and slides. Um, and here's some young students, it looks like, maybe on a class trip down there. I kept seeing visual education pop up in all articles and discourse regarding the art department. So that was kind of the buzz term that they used to describe their particular focus. Now, this is a headline uh, from the Gazette uh, stating Institute of Arts Museum may be merged. So the two organizations, uh, there was a committee developed that Flora B. Roberts was on, um, and we're talking in 1929 still, um, and the idea was to pursue the idea of merging uh, the Arts Institute with the museum. And it seemed, at least from Flora B. Roberts' um, recollection, that uh, things were positive, um, that it sounded like a very good idea, um, and uh, they just needed to find a little bit more room. But coming out of this is the merger between the two. So the name changes from, or to the Kalamazoo Museum, an art institute, that is the official name. Uh, this is a contract that the school board and the art institute um, go into. Uh, I did not, it's several pages long and it basically outlines what uh, the Board of Education is responsible for and what the art institute is responsible for. Um, but in 1929, uh, September 1929, they took the legal um, contract in um, in order, and so the Art Institute is officially part of the school system now. Now, they wanted, um, because more than a contract, they wanted to put together um, a committee uh, um, that was comprised of folks from the Art Institute, uh, or the, that would have a little bit more information about the Art Institute and those who were a little bit more interested in developing the museum. And so these are some of the members in that first committee in 1930. Uh, it was an advisory board, and uh, it dissolved three years later uh, from a lack of activity, and um, it never really did what it was intended to, which was to kind of oversee this merger. Now, the Coffer House is next to the Peck House. So if you were walking down the street today, basically somewhere around where our parking lot is, there on the corner of Rose Street and Lovell Street, is where this house is located. Um, and it ultimately ends up being referred to as the Art House. Um, this is where the KIA will move um, shortly after the merger. Now, Flora B. Roberts, uh, in 1929, um, she mentions in her recollections that 
they were always worried about this house because there were constantly realtors who were taking people in and around the corner and they were very worried that the house would be bought and probably torn down and used to put something like a filling station is what she was worried about specifically. Um, so she um, had a good relationship with um, Dr. Upjohn, and so she encouraged him to purchase this house. And he said, well, I'll give you as much as you paid for the pack house, which was $40,000. So he contributed $40,000, um, and the school system chipped in the $20,000 to purchase this house. And what its ultimate use was, uh, depending on who you asked, um, was somewhat contestable. So this is a quote that I found um, while reading um, the recollections of Flora. Um, it was, she quoted uh, Burns' best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, she was very optimistic, and then she gets to this point as she's talking about this whole history, and she says, and then things kind of went off the rails uh, and quoted Burns. So um, Flora B. Roberts was definitely somebody who had an idea as to the, the merger, and she was pro-merger, and was somebody who thought that the Art Institute could be combined with the museum, overseen by the governments of the Board of Education and everyone would be successful and everything would work out. Um, but I think Blanche Hall, who takes over, as we saw in 1930, she was not on the original committee um, that put the merger together. And while I'm speculating here as a historian, I would probably suggest that maybe she was a little bit cooler to the idea of a merger. Um, someone said in the research that I found that she would have thought that combining uh, the two groups would have been, you know, stodgy and to, to uh, um, she was interested in contemporary art, promoting the Art Institute as something very sort of singular, focused on contemporary, whereas the museum and the library were much more interested in preservation, and I, it doesn't sound like there would have been a big conflict, but apparently these nuances existed. Um, and then she hired uh, the first KIA director, Sylvester Jerry, an artist from Chicago. And it sounds as though she did so without maybe getting permission from the Board of Education. This created a little bit of friction, and um, the friction continued onward. Um, some of it focused on the, uh, the house itself and who would ultimately use it. It was purchased by the Board of Education, there's no doubt uh, that occurred, but, um, and Flora B. Roberts suggests in her recollections that everybody knew that the house was being purchased for the expansion of the museum, which continued to grow, grow, grow. So, um, John dies in 1932, and so there may have been some hard feelings about what the house was ultimately used for because uh, increasingly the museum starts to spill over from the pet house into the coffer house next door as they run out of room. Uh, here's a quote that I will read because I, it, it just speaks to the, uh, the sort of uh, feelings that may have been a little bit raw. Added to this uh, trying situation, she's talking about the Depression, uh, there developed tension between the museum in the library house and the work in the art house. This was largely due to maladjusted personalities and lack of confidence and appreciative understanding of the work undertaken by each group. I could read her all day long. She's very candid in her recollections. Um, and here she is um, admitting that there were some, um, some feelings, some acrimonious feelings between the various uh, individuals involved. Um, she said, I think they think I want to run everything, and, um, and I don't, um, but she certainly had a vision, and those who were 
part of the Art Institute had that vision. So. I really wish I could have found a, a later photograph um, that spoke to uh, the different kinds of the, the large animals that were donated uh, to the museum. Um, behind the coffer house, there was a carriage house that the KIA really saw as potential for having their art classes back there. And it eventually housed a bunch of Alaskan animals stuffed animals, they were not living, um, which I would love to know where they are if they weren't thrown away. Um, but this is a very early version of the basement, uh, the library here, but in Peck's original um, donation to the museum was a lot of coral materials here. Uh, but one of the recollections of um, somebody at the Art Institute referred to this as the war of the stuffed animals and birds, um, as increasingly more and more of the museum was encroaching uh, into their space. And uh, they really were concerned that uh, they weren't able to uh, grow and to develop a permanent collection and have the room for visiting exhibits. Um, but even with all this tension, and we're talking here in the early 1930s, um, Everyone still continued to, to do some really great stuff. So the Depression is uh, you know, the, the, something that they did not foresee when the merger was put together. This happened shortly after the merger. Um, and when I talk about looking at history from a very broad lens, uh, you have to look at all of the different particulars that go into why institutions develop, why they succeed, why they don't succeed, why they happen in this city and not this city. Um, the, during the Depression, they, the KIA continued to flourish, despite the fact that they had very few resources uh, at their uh, disposal. Um, and these are just some of the kinds of things that uh, in the Peck House, uh, or excuse me, the Comfort House, uh, they continue to do. Um, their first full-time director uh, took over in 1931, um, and that was um, Sylvester Jerry, and they did pay him, but they did not have very many funds for anything else. So this is something that I didn't know, um, just to see some of the big-named art, uh, artists who came to Kalamazoo. I was very surprised. I didn't know that the Crew CA came. Um, Diego Rivera came in 1934, and um, 575 people attended uh, his talk at the um, Civic Auditorium. Um, there were a few others in the early 1940s that I didn't include here, um, but this was something that they were still very active in doing, which was to bring visiting artists to lecture on a particular topic. The Depression was a big deal, obviously, um, and while the community fared the Depression relatively well um, because of the diversified economy here in Kalamazoo, um, the Board of Education was not able to live up to much of what they had originally stated in terms of financial support of the Art Institute, and that was in due part because of budget cuts. Um, there was a law um, that limited the amount you could tax uh, that was passed in 1933, 32, I think it was, and it basically really forced the school board to say, look, we are going to cut. And whatever contract we would entered into originally, um, unfortunately, we will not be able to do much more than assist you in very small ways. So they really, the Art Institute really had to depend on the original $20,000 gift that was given to them by a Mrs. James Nelson Ring. And she grew up in Kalamazoo uh, and then ended up in Chicago. And she was wealthy and she was very interested in uh, promoting the arts. And one of the funny stories was that it sounded like 
somebody had mentioned that she got a cab in Chicago and drove it to, to Kalamazoo to donate money to all the various uh, organizations that she supported. And I imagine, uh, you know, in the 1920s, what kind of a, a cost that would have been to drive a taxi cab all the way to Kalamazoo. But, um, but she did, and that was the, really the basis for being able to survive during the Depression. Um, they had a little bit more money in their coffers from a donation from the Ralph Harmon Booth family, and they were the family that ran the Kalamazoo Gazette at the time. Uh, Lois Cole um, preceded uh, Sylvester Jerry. Um, she was actually part of the library, um, and she was um, the original staff person who were, was assigned basically by Florida Roberts to assist with the Art Institute. Um, it kind of sounds like she got pushed into the role and maybe the Art Institute wasn't necessarily interested in her, in her uh, having her there, um, so they ended up just hiring her own director who was paid um, primarily from the, uh, the $20,000 that they had. But uh, membership uh, vacillated roughly 250 to 350 a year. Uh, tickets were sold to nine members uh, for the guest lecture series. Um, but the growth of local arts network through both academia and individual artists persisted despite the KIA's limited funds. I'm amazed as I go through these scrapbooks um, at how many things that they would continue to do throughout the 1930s um, with very little uh, wiggle room. Um, the other thing to note is that the, the house, the copper house, was in pretty bad shape. And one of the original parts of the contract was that the uh, school board would assist them with a the janitor and with uh, the costs of repair. Um, and by 1933, that pretty much dried up. They didn't have the money to fund even the library and the museum and the school system. Um, the library, in fact, reduced their hours and didn't buy new books. So it was a tough, tough for all institutions, certainly, uh, during the 1930s. This uh, is very specific. Um, this will kind of tell you how little money uh, they had to survive uh, in the 1930s, uh, the membership dues um, were essentially their lifeblood. And um, I think if you do the math there, they may have made about $7 over uh, in 1938 or so. So um, they were on a shoestring budget, and it's remarkable how many uh, exhibits they were able to pull off um, during this time period. Um, so, the uh, catalog there to the left uh, is just one of the things that they did uh, during this time period. Um, but here are a few others there. Um, they had uh, exhibitions that included uh, Picasso and Klee, Japanese prints, ceramics, African art. Um, and of course, every year they had a local uh, exhibition featuring local artists as well. So they were, they were still busy, still doing a lot of things. Here's just another catalog, one of their early exhibits. And this was a brochure of just some of the activities that they were involved in. Um, and, and while exhibits were certainly important, the guest lectures were important, um, if they were going to flourish, they certainly needed to um, kind of build a network of local artists. And so there was a lot of classes focused on children and school age children. So. I just had to put this draw ink drawing there of the coffer house uh, there to the right, just because I thought it was. 
Um, but these were some other classes and programs that they were involved in. Some of the films that they showed, I've never seen the Italian straw hat, but I'm eager to see it. I don't know if it's out there, um, but a romance in Budapest is another one I'm not necessarily particularly. Um, and they had teas, um, uh, they had a classical music listening um, that they probably used some albums from the art department. Eviction is a chilling word. So they got letters from the Board of Education periodically for most of this time period, throughout the 30s and early 40s, saying, you know what, you might need to start thinking about leaving. Um, but in 1943, the library's art department and school station department moved into the coffer house. One of the things that uh, Flora B. Roberts really developed was uh, branch libraries in the 1920s, as well as libraries within the schools. And the, the personnel uh, that uh, oversaw the, the library service in schools uh, had offices and they were moving them into the coffer house there. So um, the KIA was, they were run out of room and had to think uh, a little bit more of their long-term survival. So, from 1945 to 47, they thought about where to go. And this is the house that they ended up buying from the American Legion um, in 1945, and they reopened the art museum in 1947. Um, not surprising, there wasn't a lot of room in this house, as that's the major theme for today, is that uh, you need room uh, if you're going to be a successful organization. And so even at the time of their reopening in 1947, um, they were thinking long term about a new building, which um, they will, of course, build later on. So. If it sounded like there was an acrimonious relationship between the two institutions, there might have been a little bit, but they both continued to prosper, even after they, uh, the Art Institute left the school uh, system. And these are just some of the kinds of things that I was thinking about that the library still continues to do to sort of promote uh, the arts here locally. Um, one of the things in my former job as the audiovisual department was to really add a lot of films um, having to do with art. So if anybody is familiar with our film collection, we have a lot of documentaries about arts, art movements, um, different artists. Um, so while there was certainly strain uh, during this time period, I would argue that uh, both institutions have been very successful over their time. So, so uh, these are just a few of the pieces. We have some public art here at the uh, Counties Public Library. Um, if you've been in the stairwells, you've probably seen this one here. Um, you'll have to excuse my photography here. Uh, we don't have the professional lighting here at the, the library that you have here. So, um, and these are just scattered throughout the building. Uh, mostly purchased in the 90s when the library was renovating. So we don't really have much. Anything that was probably part of the original collection went with the museum down the street, I suspect, including a lot of the, um, the Todd collection. So and this is our wonderful rainbow uh, light sculpture by Michael Hayden which really works well when we have light, not so much during the five months of winter. Um, here are some of my sources if you're at all interested in stopping by the library. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask. Yes, Frank. Yeah. So the 421 South Street House, is that this site? Yeah, so the question uh, for our digital viewers is, is the house that they bought on South Street uh, the current site of the Art Institute, and that is correct. 
uh, it was uh, bulldozed um, to make room for the current building. So. Yes? I hope I remember this right, but was it a stereogram that they had at the library? Uh, yes, uh, the question is, was there a stereograph uh, at the library? And yes, part of the art department that the library had uh, in the 20s included uh, mostly slides, uh, lots of prints, and these were things that could be you know, checked out. They were cataloged. Uh, Flora B. Roberts really took the whole cataloging idea to a new level and cataloged everything so that it could circulate and be used by the public um, in lots. Um, but yes, they had a very large stereograph collection. I actually found a binder um, that was probably made in the 1950s or so that had an entire list of all the stereographs that they had in their collection. But that would all be done for the museum now. And what, what is a stereograph? Oh, well, uh, I would encourage you to watch several art breaks ago. Um, it was discussed a little bit, but it's basically uh, an image uh, that was shot that is it, that applied on a, a card, cardstock, like a postcard. Um, but there's two of the same image, and so it has dimensional depth to it. And so you use the stereo to read it, and it actually brings out that dimension. So she's the stereo ref expert here. Yes, we. if you're in the library, I encourage you to go up to the second floor where the local history room is located, uh, and we have an exhibit of um, stereographs of Gamma of Gamma Sue photographer in Wallace. So. Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, none of the, were any of the buildings that I uh, featured, the Peck House and the Copper House, uh, still standing? That is correct. Um, they were torn down to make room for the 1950s version of the library in the late 1950s, and they built the second version of the, uh, the library. So. Yeah. You mentioned uh, collections that you the question is, uh, where are the guy? Where is the guy Lockwood collection housed? Uh, it's we have uh, quite a few of his materials at the downtown library. Um, I believe Western Michigan University also has an extensive amount of his, uh, and I don't have them processed or cataloged, but I just had a family member of his donate some more of this work to us just a few weeks ago. So I'm very excited to go through that box of materials, which I believe are a lot of his uh, original sonnets uh, and various other publications. Um, Guy Lockwood is uh, somebody who, uh, I, I don't know if he had much of a connection with the Art Institute. His name never seemed to pop up during this time period, um, but he was certainly a local artist and one of the nation's first uh, to, to develop an art school, a correspondence art school, which he had over off of Parkview Avenue across from Woods Lake area. And he was a very interesting individual, a vegetarian, he was a socialist, he was on the city commission for a very brief moment in time, um, ran for other state offices, um, very prolific uh, artist, so he's an interesting character here for Cal too. Yeah. How did um, Todd's collection of artwork end up at the museum and not at the academy? That's a, the question is why, why didn't the Todd collection of art end up at the, uh, why did it end up at the museum and not the Art Institute? Um, that's a good question. I think he donated it primarily to the museum at the time um, before the Art Institute and the museum were merged. And so I'm assuming that it was mostly the property of the school system. And so when the museum ultimately left 
to go down to where its current location is. I, everything that was part of that collection, including porcelain and very old uh, paintings, went with it. I, I, you'd have to probably check with the librarian here to see if there are other uh, Todd collection pieces that are part of the Art Institute. I wouldn't be surprised. He was, sounds like he was very giving about his, of his uh, purchases. Yeah. In years past, in a larger city, the public library donated, didn't go, had artwork that patrons could check out, framed reproductions of famous people. Has this uh, library ever done anything like that? Uh, the question is, um, did, did we circulate at one time uh, framed artwork? And the answer is yes. Uh, that program was discontinued, oh gosh, sometime around maybe 2009 or so. Um, it was there and active when I was hired in 2003, so, but uh, it didn't last much longer than that. Uh, it was taking up some space. It didn't circulate very well at the time, and I'm not sure. I think it was beloved by several people that used it a lot, and uh, it was just deemed something that had maybe uh, worn out its welcome. But yes, we did have it. Um, it was small, but uh, an array of different paintings um, that you could take home with you and put up in your house or your business for a while. So. Hi, we knew that there were probably a few people that would be disappointed that it was being dissolved, um, which is always the case with our, our uh, library collections. Um, so. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to suggest that the library rethink that because if you can uh, borrow a mixer to phone and make friends, <laughs> that is a wonderful point. Uh, the question was a suggestion. Uh, for those watching from home uh, about us mapping that um, as part of our library of things program, which I, uh, I concur, I agree. So. Right. Well, thank you for coming out, everybody. Bye.